I was a boy of uh, spiritual curiosity. I was not contented with the explanations of the uh, Roman Catholic priests who deliver lectures in the church. I used to question them regarding a human soul, salvation, hell, heaven and such things. The answers they gave me, I felt that uh, they were not uh, adequate. I felt that uh, I need uh, uh, more clarity. When I questioned them that way, uh, they felt that uh, I was under the impact of uh, Satan, Lucifer. Namaste, I'm Deepthi. The foundation of Indian civilization is the Vedic culture. The Vedas were revealed through rishis, highly evolved humans with high receptivity, extraordinary memory, and supreme intellect. Without the use of modern equipment, the rishis were able to make many scientific discoveries, which are only now being discovered by modern science. The rishis are, in fact, considered the source of inspiration for many European scientists and philosophers like Plato and Pythagoras. Today, we have a very special guest with us who has made it his life's mission to spread the message of the rishis and make it more accessible. D.A. Joseph G. is the founder of Rishi Dharma Foundation, an organization with the vision of bringing about renaissance of the forgotten Vedic values through the propagation of ancient Sanskrit and Tamil literature. D.A. Joseph G. was born in a Roman Catholic family in Madurai, Tamil Nadu. He learned the Shastras through his guru, Sri Veera Raghava Ingar. He has delivered thousands of lectures on the Upanishads, Smritis, Alvars, Gita, and also on the social problems of India. Namaste, Joseph Ji. Very, very warm welcome. Uh, namaste. Namaste, namaste. Joseph Ji, uh, Joseph Ji, how did you start your journey with uh, Sanatana Dharma? It dates back uh, to my early days. When I was very young, I was a boy of uh, spiritual curiosity. I was not contented with the explanations of the uh, Roman Catholic priests who delivered lectures in the church. I used to question them regarding a human soul, salvation, hell, heaven and such things. The answers they gave me, I felt that uh, were not uh, adequate. I felt that uh, I need uh, uh, more clarity. When I questioned them that way, uh, they felt that uh, I was under the impact of uh, Satan, Lucifer. They started questioning uh, religion itself. But I said I have no evil motive. I just want to quench my thirst. My brain annoys me to know more and more about uh, God. Uh, the explanation we find in the Holy Bible is not sufficient for me. Then they said, uh, see, what we know is the knowledge given by the Bible only. We do not know more than that. More than that is not revealed to humanity because God thinks that they must be secret. When he himself thinks that they must be secretive, why do you uh, probe into them? Please be satisfied with what uh, you are given and go ahead to march on along the path of Christianity, they said. But I was not obedient to them. I felt uh, that the curiosity got over me. So gradually I started moving with uh, uh, scholars of other religion. Other religion, uh, you know, like Islam, uh, Buddhism, Jainism, and even subsects. I used to uh, go in search of uh, those people uh, sit in the row to listen to their lectures. Uh, but um, those lectures uh, enlightened me a little more, but not absolutely. Even that was not sufficient to me. While I was a law student in Bangalore, I used to attend uh, uh, the lectures delivered by one Sri Buddha Ketra. He was a Buddhist priest, a well-learned man. He used to deliver lectures every Saturday or Sunday. I used to sit there. Uh, I felt that uh, Buddhism threw more light on spirituality than my own religion. But still I felt that uh, something was lacking. Then I jumped over to Saivism. 
ஒன் சிவ சுப்பிரமணிய ஐயர் ஹி வாஸ் அவைலபிள் இன் மதுரை ஹி வாஸ் ஸ்காலர் இன் சைவ சித்தாந்தா அண்ட் ஹி என்லைட்டன் மே அபவுட் சைவிசம் ஐ பிகேம் அ ஸ்டூடெண்ட் ஆஃப் ஒன் மட் கால்டு திருவாவுடுதுறை அதீனம் அண்ட் தோஸ் பீப்புள் வேர் கண்டக்டிங் ரெகுலர் லெசன்ஸ் பை கிளாஸஸ் அண்ட் தே ஈவன் கண்டக்டட் எக்ஸாம்ஸ் at the end of which they will issue a certificate so i became thorough with saiva siddhanta and even then i felt that something was lacking so then um, the only opening for me left over then was to contact uh, my tamil master uh, who was working in st mary's high school madurai where i was uh, studying my 10th standard and 11th standard i approached him for further explanations and he was kind enough to explain vaishnavism to me and one interesting interesting thing about him is that he used to welcome questions he, even nagging questions he would welcome even if uh, my questions sounded like uh, ragging him or bullying him he would be happy only he would induce me to ask more and more of such questions and that was a great encouragement to me because i never met such a man because whenever a spiritual scholar is questioned he gets irritated he feels that uh, the student is uh, wrong he is over uh, curious he would like to shut up my mouth only this was the only person who said you ask any question sometimes i used to ask you know even irritating questions like this you know you say that lord vishnu is uh, sleeping on a snake adisesha a thousand headed snake it is ridiculous and funny doesn't he get a good bed for laying down my question is why should he lie down at all god should be brisk why should he lie down on and that on a snake it's a ridiculous concept but even such questions he used to answer me satisfactorily i went on inventing questions uh say questions like uh, if ravana had uh, 10 heads uh, it's not an even number if it is 11 okay one head in the center five heads this side five heads this side it is even if it is 10 how can it be even now when he lies down if he turns on his side uh, how would those heads uh, uh, equalize his position it will be a troublesome sleep uh, if he gets cold which nose will a uh, wuzo uh, flim such questions i used to ask na eh? he won't get irritated he will be happy he used to say you see my children uh, are not this much curious when i started explaining vedas to them they would move away i was very sad about it god has shown me a good disciple saying so he started answering me this question answer series went on for 25 years quarter of a century and uh, day by day i felt that my spiritual knowledge was uh, getting strengthened i was getting a moral satisfaction and i thought uh, that i have come to the person to whom i should come in this birth and uh, this ramanuja's philosophy of vishishta advaita who will explain the in contrast with the sankaracharya's advaita was very interesting the concept of uh, soul the concept of uh, god the concept of maya these things were cleared of all my doubts i had lots of doubts in my mind and this man was capable of uh, removing 10 questions by one explanation that is perhaps the greatness of the religion he belongs to but uh, his patience and uh, his welcoming nature was very much a, a basis a foundation for my knowledge of hinduism then uh, i felt uh, settled and satisfied with uh, sri vaishnavism uh, preached by the rayangar and all my questions were appeased they were settled down and they started uh, uh, finding out the brighter side of uh, hinduism i learned uh, sanskrit from him i learned uh, 
all the six branches of Hinduism from him. He was a great scholar in Tamil literature also. And he would explain the root of every word, every Sanskrit word or every Tamil word. He would correlate uh, uh, languages in an ingenious way. So, for example, in uh, Sanskrit we say for often the word Pade Pade. Pade means step. Pade Pade means for every step. In Tamil, we say Adi Kadi. Adi means step, for every step. He would say the word English often is totally different from the Sanskrit often and Tamil often. Whereas Sanskrit often is very much uh, in relation with Tamil often. In Tamil, we say Adi Kadi. In Sanskrit, we say Pade Pade. So the same uh, concept, you see, remains in both the, both the languages, but the only expression is different. Like that, he was, a, he was an etymologist, he was a linguist, and he was a, a what, do you, what do you say, you know, pioneer in uh, perusing the root of languages. A very great man. The only thing, uh, sad, sad thing about his, his name didn't come out. For his learning and for his scholarship, he should have become as popular as Vivekananda. Such a great scholar he was. But uh, the only thing God did was, he poured uh, into my brain all he learned. And now I am his replica. I am his reflection, uh, spreading his name. But uh, while he reached the feet of holy feet of God, he had still very much of stock of knowledge to give me but days were not sufficient. So it was an incomplete journey. Anyway, this is how I started entering Sanatana Dharma. Next question. Yeah. This is fascinating. Thank you so much, Joseph Ji. Uh, like they say, when the disciple is ready, the guru appears. So um, we're very glad that uh, you found your guru and now we are able to learn from you as well. Uh, Joseph Ji, can you uh, explain at a very high level what is the essential difference between the philosophies of Shaivism and Vaish Vaishnavism? Basically, I would say that uh, only Murthis differ. That is, they worship Lord Shiva as the Almighty God. These people worship Lord Vishnu. Other than these uh, things, I don't think there is much difference in, uh, in the, between these uh, religions. Uh, if you follow the tenets uh, preached by a Saivite. Saivism says you will reach the holy feet of Lord Shiva. Here in Vaishnavism, they say if you follow the tenets of Vaishnavism, you will reach the feet of Lord Vishnu. That is the only difference. But basically, they have principles the same. Nomenclature is different. You see, here in Vaishnavism, they say Chit, Achit, and Ishvara. Whereas in Saivism, they say Pashu, Pati, and Pasam. The nomenclature is different, but the matter conveyed is the same. The karma theory, the surrender uh, root, uh, everything is there. Here we have the alvas, there we have the nayanmas, both have sung in the same tone, bhakti, prapati, uh, surrendering, everything is the same. So I think uh, there need not be any fight between uh, Saivite and Vaishnavite, but that is what is happening today. At the peak of the thing, you know, every Saivite uh, knows to hate a Vaishnavite, and every Vaishnavite is particular about uh, ridiculing a Saivite. Uh, anyway, it's going on. So, help us understand the karma theory. Karma theory is an answer to many questions which uh, suffering people raise. You know, in life, uh, uh, we find uh, two. Uh, prominent segregations of humanity. One, the rich society. The other, the poor society. Rich society never questions about uh, life and death. Rich society never questions about God because they are happy with the money they have. They face no difficulties in life. So they don't go to the question of why this man is suffering, why that man is suffering, why he is lame, why that fellow is uh, fat. All these questions, they are least interested. They are interested in uh, multiplying their money only. But if you come to the poor section of society, people who are financially lagging behind, uh, they are very much pained uh, to know that God is so cruel to them. 
they say god is a, a kind personality if you go to temple you see a lord vishnu or shiva showing the palm like this be well be well but nothing happens here yeah? just because showing this hand like this a poor man does not become rich yeah? he goes to the temple he worships and he sees the god showing his hand like this subhamastu subhamastu but no subham comes yeah? now my question is a god who is benevolent who is kind should give me more uh, uh, happiness i am poor financially i am sick i am suffering i am faced with uh, tribulations how do you explain this now these questions are answered only by karma theory unfortunately or fortunately the poor lot of society forms the majority you know rich people form only 15% as per census only 15% of human population is rich the remaining 85% they are poor people only they are all suffering only so they have hundreds of questions why god should be so unkind to us now these questions are answered satisfactorily by only karma theory karma theory says the life you are leading now has a setback previously you have already led this life before and this life is not going to end with this death it is going to continue in the next birth also and there is a chain of events you know cause and effect this is the cause and this is the effect and that is why karma theory could satisfy them you know you come to india you approach a poor man you ask him you see the man who is living opposite your house eh? he is living in a multi storied building whereas you are living in a hut what is your opinion about it he answered me he would say well that is his karma this is my karma he will talk like a philosopher so philosophy has gone into the brain of a beggar of a poor man of everybody in india in india we find a sort of intellectual satisfaction to all these questions whereas in other countries they are not happy with their religion their religion does not give them satisfaction in uh, seeking answers for such questions whereas hinduism has done it it's all because of karma theory so every suffering man is able to satisfy himself is able to appease his emotions saying okay i did some papa karma in the previous birth that is why i suffer even a, a, a clerk he enters the manager's room he gets fired there huh? the manager shouts at him he barks like a dog you are a fool idiot like that listening to all those uh, harsh words he comes back and sits on the chair he says perhaps in the previous but i was the manager and he was the clerk the account is settled now so he is able to satisfy himself like that eh? whereas uh, the same incident uh, if it happens in a foreign country this clerk would think of some revenge i will take vengeance against this fellow so it continues whereas the hinduism uh, puts down all uh, animalistic emotions it uh, brings man back to his human standards so we are all indebted to karma theory uh, very interesting uh, joseph ji sometimes uh, the arguments uh, that people have against karma theory is it makes people very uh, complacent they don't want to change their circumstances because they think it's karma and they just uh accept it and don't try to get better uh, what do you think about that like uh, how can we explain that the vedas which which preaches karma theory mm. uh, tells us that karma can be uh, changed if you are a man enjoying good karma that is if you are rich and affluent if you are happy by your bad karma you will get down be careful don't go for bad karma if you are suffering from bad karma suppose you are poor suppose you are sick even then you can change your karma by certain prayers by certain penance by certain uh, bad change of mentality and they have given us enough examples from puranas and itihasas how that was made possible you know we find the story of uh, druva druva was a small boy of five he wanted to become uh, the greatest uh, um, what do you call a man sitting on the 
uh, highest designation. The Lord Vishnu made him Dhruva Nakshatra. Dhruva Nakshatra is superior to Lord Brahma himself. Karma theory says, creation theory says that Brahma is number one. But Dhruva was kept in a place which is superior to that. So even creation protocol can be changed by uh, some prayers or by some good deeds, merits. So people must understand that uh, you know, there is nobody on earth who has uh, no bad karma. Even the richest man will be suffering from some minus factor. His wife will be non-cooperative or his uh, health will be lagging behind or some uh, uh, negative factor he will be suffering from. So even that thing can be changed, eradicated by following certain discipline. For that they are, uh, there are uh, several shanti karmas. Every Purana says, do this, this karma will change. Now, recently, I published one uh, video called the Shankar Gita. Shankar Gita is found in uh, Vyasa Bharata. Uh, Shankar Gita is nothing but a conversation between uh, Goddess Parvati and Lord Shiva. Even though Vyasa Bharata is a Vaishnavite uh, epic, uh, there is uh, a very many, very many sections, you know, there are, which speak about uh, Lord Shiva and other deities. And on one occasion, Goddess Parvati asks uh, Lord, Oh Lord, will you be kind enough to explain to me which Baba Karma results in which uh, form of punishment? For example, why is, uh, why is a man born blind? Please answer me. He says, you know, people who peep into bathrooms of uh, um, other men's wives while taking bath. They are born blind. He answers like that. And why are some men born lame? You know, some people are born without a leg. Why is it so? Lord Shiva says, uh, you know, people who kick uh, holy objects, that is a uh, Vigraha of Lord Krishna. This fellow gets wild because his mother doesn't serve him food. He gets angry. You're always reading Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavad Gita. You don't care for your family. Let this uh, Lord Krishna go to dogs. He goes and kicks that uh, Vigraha of Lord Krishna. The uh, Vigraha gets broken. This man will be born lame in the next birth, Lord Shiva says. So like that, hundreds of questions uh, Goddess Parvati shoots. Uh, why is uh, a man black? Uh, why is a man suffering from leukoderma? Uh, why is a man dumb? Why is a man deaf? Uh, who is a man poor, who is a man um, being tortured by his boss. So all those uh, questions and answers, you know, they make you rich with information. They make you happy about life. Then you feel that I have nothing to worry about. So these uh, Shastras tell us that the karma can be changed. And that is the answer. Uh, switching to Vedas, uh, could you help us understand what are Vedas and how are they relevant to the society today? You know, I have uh, given a lecture uh, saying that there are 100 individualities of Hinduism. One of them is Vedas. You know, every religion has its holy book. Islam has Quran. Christianity has the Bible. Like that every religion has a holy book. The difference between the holy book of Hinduism is it is named as Veda. Veda means knowledge. No, Vid, Vid means Vidwan. Vid means uh, knowing. So, increasing your knowledge is Veda. If you turn to the pages of Vedas, it not only deals with uh, God, it deals with everything you find around you. Nature is explained. Your body is explained. Your fortune is explained. Astronomy is explained. Astrology is explained. We find everything there. Whatever you need, we find there. And they classify food into three categories as sattvic food, rajasic food and tamasic food. This food will give you this quality. That food will give you that quality. Avoid this. Eat that. Do not move with every kind of man. Man has emanating radiation. 
that radiation will have its effect on others. Don't move with such people. Always find yourself in satsangam. So these things, they have analyzed life, they have analyzed nature, they have analyzed philosophy to such an extent that you cannot point out a single thing which they have not touched. Everything they have dealt with, even aircrafts, even uh, navigation, everything, everything, black magic, white magic, uh, Samudriga Shastra, everything. And there is nothing you can say which has been left over. And you know, we have heard about Max Muller. Max Muller is a German scholar. That man, uh, he says, uh, when I look over the globe and when I see to evaluate the strength of the literature of every religion or every nationality, I would say that if at all there is a nation which has gone to the highest to reach in the knowledge of every branch of science available, it is the Hindu religion. Is this. Only Hinduism has thoroughly analyzed everything. And if you read all Hindu scriptures, you would feel that you have learned everything you must. So these Vedas enlighten you not only on subjects like God and man, but also on your surroundings, on the beginning of the world, the future of the world, the hidden treasures of nature, everything. So I think uh, Vedas have not been sufficiently utilized. You know, people think that Veda means uh, some stotras, some uh, namaha, 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 like that. That is Vedas. No, it is not like that. It is a bundle of knowledge. It's a heaped uh, hill of knowledge. And you can keep on reading. You would have heard about a story. There was a man, I think his name is Yavakrita. Um, he wanted to uh, peruse the Vedas completely before he gets married. He says, uh, if I get married, I won't be able to read the Vedas. So before marriage, I will finish the Vedas. His parents uh, have fixed a girl for him. The arbitration is over. This much of jewels and this much of uh, uh, money, everything is over now. But this fellow says, wait, wait, wait. I have, I'm yet to finish Vedas. What happens is, he becomes an old man of 100. He has reached a century. That girl is dead. Now these parents, they go and uh, uh, cry before Indra. Indra was uh, their favorite deity. You have given us such a son. Then Indra appears before the boy. He says, hey man, you have wasted your youth. Your parents uh, feel very sad about it. Okay, I will make you a youth again and give you another hundred years to live. Get married and be happy, man. So he becomes a young man again. They think that he is going to get married. So they fix another girl for him. But this fellow says, I won't come out of my study room. I have to complete my Vedas. So this happening repeats for four times. 400 years pass away. Four times he became old and four times he became young. But no marriage to take place. Now Indra appears to him in an angry mood. He says, you fool. You think that you can cover up all Vedas. Huh? I will show you the total quantity of Vedas. See, then he opens his uh, spiritual eye and then he sees, that fellow says, oh, yeah, a big heap of Vedas. And what he has mastered so far, it is only this much. What he has to study is Himalayan in height. Huh? And Indra says, you're going to complete all these Vedas and you're going to get married. Eh? You're an idiot, man. Vedas can never be completed. Then, oh, I never knew about it. Then he gets married and stops reading Vedas. So this is a humorous story that, uh, that makes us understand that Vedas are unlimited. Ananta Veda. Aha. So what Vedas we have now has been given to us by Sage Vyasa uh, as a ration only. He has not given the complete Vedas. For Kali Yuga, this much of Vedas is enough. So much of uh, Atharva Veda, so much of uh, uh, Rig Veda, so much of Ejur Veda, like that. Limited only. So Vedas is an unlimited, uh, extensive ocean of knowledge. Whatever you want to know, can be learned from that. 
then uh, joseph ji how are uh, you through rishi dharma foundation helping uh, the people of today's society learn the vedas you know i i was uh, working for my phd in english literature in madurai university mm. and um, i had the opportunity of meeting uh, research scholars from foreign countries say from germany from russia from usa you know they used to come here to study tamil or to study indian philosophy something like that so we used to meet uh, frequently knowing that i am a person who knows uh, something of hinduism they would uh, shoot questions at me you please tell me you know we have a charge against hinduism you are a neutral person you can answer us you know in no religion of the world caste plays a role you go to christianity you go to islam no religion says a man belonging to this caste only is entitled to do this uh, uh, vedic rite or this uh, penance or something like that whereas hinduism says only brahmin can do this you know sankaracharya propounded advaita he is a brahmin ramanuja he established vishishta advaita he is a brahmin then uh, uh, madhvacharya he established dvaita he is a brahmin now you come to say that only brahmins can uh, propound religions only they can be gurus now this uh, uh, audacious uh, uh, uniqueness is not found in other religions there anybody can become if only you are uh, knowledgeable if only you are a, a man of capacity you can become a spiritual leader what do you say for this this is what uh, they want to know from me the one reason why they chose me for this question is i won't lose my temper i would answer them calmly then i i told them you see you are looking at only a section of hindus what sankara taught what ramanuja taught and what madhvacharya taught they form only a portion of hinduism that is not complete hinduism if you would go back to the history of hinduism we have very much to learn in the days of your rishis rishis are absolutely above caste i can show you many rishis who are non brahmins they have collected the vedas they have been the preceptors of vedas and the brahmin people have fallen and uh, touched their feet to learn knowledge from them i would tell you the case of a butcher a butcher whose uh, name was dharma vyada he was a commercial butcher born for a butcher he would uh, kill a goat every day skin it off sell mutton to people who buy but uh, rishis were waiting at his door steps for him to complete the business and come to them for vedic discussion and they used to clarify their doubts about vedas from that butcher that butcher would say i sell mutton but i won't eat mutton because it is my uh, tenacity my business of tenacity i'm doing it that's all and he was more learned than brahmins he was more learned than rishis and rishis used to touch his feet and worship him and you know the story goes this way you know there was a rishi called uh, uh, konkana rishi uh, while doing penance it seems a bird flying uh, above his head in the sky uh, it uh, committed nuisance upon his head uh, the toilet matter you know it fell on his uh, head he was so much perturbed he felt it disturbed he looked up when he looked up he, he saw the bird doing this nuisance huh? he was so angry that he looked at the bird with scorching eyes immediately the bird was burnt to ashes and he felt his parents disturbed and uh, he wanted a break so he got up he went into the village nearby asking for food he gave me some food the lady of the house she wanted to him 
said, I am getting my husband food. I can come to you now. Then he said, Rishi, do you know who I am? I am a Rishi. Your husband is an ordinary man. You must listen to me first. Then she said, you thought I am a bird which you burnt in the forest. Eh? You cannot burn me like that man because I believe in Pati Seva. I look upon my husband as God and I have been doing service to him for the last 10 years and I have penance which is stronger than yours. Mind that. Then that, that Rishi was taken away, shocked. How does this lady know about my burning that bird? I did that in the forest. She is living in this city. Then she said, are you surprised to know about my spiritual effulgence? There is another man in the same village. He is a butcher. He is called uh, Dharma Vyada. You go to him. He has a lot more to teach you. Then he comes to the butcher. Then he finds out that uh, just by a profession, a man does not go down. Profession is something different from your knowledge and way of living. So this is what our rishis uh, have to say. <coughs> when that is so, how can you say that Hinduism is uh, caste-ridden? How do you say that uh, uh, Brahmins monopolize uh, religion in Hinduism? No, because these things are, have not come to light. If you read thoroughly Hinduism, Brahminism is just one section of it. But above that transcends our Hinduism. Hinduism is higher than all those things. So Hinduism does not belong to any class, any section. So then I thought I will start an association, an organization as a Rishi Dharma Foundation. It's a trust. This would propagate, of course, Hinduism, but I would not use the name of Sankara or Ramanuja or Madhva or any spiritual leader because it gives a wrong understanding that Hinduism belongs to Brahmins only. It is not so. You know, you would have read the Ramayana. In Ramayana, we find uh, uh, King Dasaratha, the father of Rama, getting cursed by a Rishi. You know, thinking that an elephant is drinking water, using Sabdavedi, this fellow shoots a, an arrow, but actually there is no elephant. It is the son of that Rishi taking water for his father. This arrow goes and uh, kills that boy. He, the boy before dying, requests the King Dasarada, please tell my father that I am dead. He goes to the father of the boy, he tells that your son is dead. That man is a blind man, old man. And so he says, just as I am going to die because of Putra Soga, you will die because of Putra Soga. Uh, having sent your son to forest, you will uh, suffer the pangs of a separation and you will die. He gives a curse. At that time, uh, Dasarada mistake seemed to be a Brahmin Rishi. He says, Brahma Rishi, please uh, pardon me. That Rishi, you know what he says? I am not a Brahmin. I am not a Brahmin. I am a Vaishya Rishi, he says. So there we come across in Ramayana itself a Rishi who is not a Brahmin. And he is able to curse a Chatriya. A Chatriya is superior to him. And it came to pass Dasarada died because of pangs of separation from his son. So, Rishitva does not depend upon caste and community. Hinduism is far above all these classes. I told them and I, I started Rishi Dharma like that, so that it will include everybody. Everybody is welcome here. Anybody belonging to any religion can come here. That's the reason. Then... Thank you so much, uh, Joseph Ji. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, that uh, you were born in a Roman Catholic family, uh, but you didn't want to change your name after you uh, started uh, talking about you know, Sanatan Dharma. So can you tell us uh, what was the reason behind it? You know, after uh, I started uh, learning Hinduism and delivering lectures on Hinduism, I was once... Uh, invited to the Kumbhabhishekam function, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in Madras. Mm -hmm. There is a place called uh, Triplicane Parthasarthi Temple. Mm -hmm. That temple 
um, uh, I was invited to give lectures on Bhagavad Gita. Mm. Uh, on that occasion, uh, one jeer from Sri Perambudur, you know, jeer means uh, Vaishnavite pontiff, a mm. Vaishnavite matadibadi. Mm. He is an Acharya Purusha. Mm. He is entitled to, to make a disciple, um, a Vaishnavite. Mm. Uh, I happened to meet him. The whole night we spent in conversation. He was fascinated by my character. He said, we need people like you only. But the unfortunate thing is, no Hindus like you. The fortunate thing is, you are like what I expected, but you are not a Hindu. So I would like to uh, put a request before you. You continue preaching Hinduism till your death. But please, for my sake, don't change your name. Because the world must understand that even Christians come to Hinduism. Because the story is normally the reverse. Only Hindus become Christians. We have not yet come across a man who is a Christian coming to Hinduism. And you are the first case. Not only that, you are well learned. You are very rhetoric. You are very oratoric. God has given you unique talents. We need such persons for preaching Vaishnavism. In this name, with this appearance, you must not change your facial appearance or your dress. You must look as you are. Till your last days, you continue this. And that will give you individuality also. I promised him, yes, I will be like that. And that is the reason. Wow, that uh, shows the profoundness and the, his wisdom also. So thank you so much for sharing that story. Uh, hmm. So, uh, uh, Joseph J, you had mentioned in one of your talks about how rishis interpreted human dreams. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about that? You know, uh, Hinduism uh, has uh, um, very many books on interpretation of dreams. Uh, books like Swapna Dhyaya, Swapna Prakashika, and there are scholars like Vogbat. You know, Vogbat is an expert in interpreting dreams. Uh, you know, the basic difference between Western dream interpretation and the Eastern dream interpretation is this. Uh, you would have heard about a, a psychiatrist called Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud is a famous uh, psychiatrist. He has done great research on dreams. He says that a dream is nothing but a wish fulfillment. For example, if I want to eat a laddu during daytime, I don't get a laddu. That night I will have a dream that I'm eating laddu. So what you could not realize in real life, you get as a dream. This is his interpretation. And he says the dream has nothing to do with future. Dream has nothing to do with your life. It is just a psychic reflection, he says. But in the East, Every dream is God sent. It is a harbinger. It is a, it is a warning, forewarning for the future happening. It has a mystic uh, reference, inference, importance. In Ramayana, uh, Sita, the wife of Rama, is being tortured in the Ashokavana by the Rakshasis of Ravana. They frighten her saying, you, you marry Ravana, if not, we will kill you and eat you. At that time, the daughter of Vibhishana, her name is Trijita, she says, you foolish Rakshasis, you do not know what is going to happen. Last night, I had a dream. In that dream, I saw this lady uh, seated on the back of an elephant, standing up and touching the moon. According to Swapna Shastra, that means she is going to become a king and her enemies will die. So our Ravana is going to die. She is going to become a queen. Her husband will come and redeem her. Trijeta says that. There we find how a dream is interpreted in Ramayana itself. You know, in uh, dreams, our Upanishads say that we are given a different body called Swapna Sarira. That body is not an illusion. We think that uh, in the dream we, uh, we find that we are running. We think it is only an imagination. 
Swapna Sastra doesn't say that. Swapna Sastra says that that figure running in the dream is not false. It is not illusion. It is a corporal body. That's called the Swapna Sarira. So, God gives you that Swapna Sarira, makes you enjoy or suffer small amounts of pleasure and pain. Some dreams are this way. Some dreams separate your karmic balance. Some dreams warn you about the oncoming dangers. Some dreams, uh, they show you that you are going to be lucky very soon. And they have given, listed, dreams in hundreds, you know. For example, if you happen to see fecal matter, the toilet fecal matter in dream, that means the next day you'll get money. Look at this strange uh, example. Huh? If you want to get money, you must see fecal matter. When I told this to some audience, one fellow said, okay, from today onwards, I will go to the toilet and have a good vision of this fecal matter and go to sleep. Let me have all uh, fecal dreams. Huh? But uh, he didn't get uh, such fecal dreams. Dreams do not come just because uh, looking at a thing before going to sleep. The next day he came and told me, I was very much disappointed. You tell me a way to get fecal dreams. I said, these dreams do not come by our making, man. It is God written, he said. And there was uh, one college professor, he was at the department. Uh, he said, sir, uh, I have uh, dreams very often, seeing fecal matter. I was worried and uh, so I went to the doctor. I got my intestines x-rayed. Uh, CT scan and all they did. They said, my stomach is perfectly all right. There's nothing wrong with you. Because I thought my intestines have some serious uh, drawback. That's why I get fecal dreams. What is your explanation? Then I said, as per Indian Shastras, if you have a dream of fecal matter, the next day you'll get money. You please turn the pages of your past and think what happened when you had a fecal dream? Then he sat for some time. Ah, you are right. You are greatly right. Whenever I get a dream of fecal matter, the next day I will get money. That's it. I said, ah, so hereafter I can feel happy about it. Yes, yes. Don't go to the doctor necessarily. So uh, dreams like this, you know, uh, if you happen to see a dream of a cow, it's good. Cow dung is good. Seeing milk is good. Seeing butter is good, but seeing buttermilk is not good. Uh, seeing any black object in dream is not good. White object is good. Uh, so like that, we have thousands and thousands of dreams explained. And I have launched uh, uh, two videos as Vedic interpretation of dreams. If you listen to them, you will get enriched. So dreams are not uh, empty visions. They are God-sent messages. Is, that is fascinating. Uh, so is there any kind of uh, pattern? Like how do we, uh, instead of going back and referring to the Shastras, like how do we kind of interpret it based on some logic? Is there a, a way to say, okay, like you mentioned, butter and milk and all that are good, but buttermilk is not good. So is it because, is there any logic or reason behind that? Yes, you know, buttermilk is not uh, a good thing. You know, you, usually in houses of uh, uh, death ceremonies, we offer buttermilk. So, if you happen to see in the dream that you are drinking buttermilk or uh, you see a glass of buttermilk, uh, and the next day you would get some bad news, some uh, death news, some news about your close relation uh, having dead or something like that, or some impairment of your own health. But if you happen to see uh, milk or uh, butter or ghee, as the Shastra say, in my own experience, I have seen uh, good things happening. And if you happen to uh, eat fruits, uh, say fruits means, uh, I mean, uh, uh, jackfruit, banana, mango, these are good fruits. If you see a dream that you are eating some uh, forest fruit, uh, it is not good. Say, for example, jujube, uh, that is not a good thing. 
but you must study it as a subject you know you can't uh, be satisfied with uh, a talk for one hour it's a big book like this uh, it runs to volumes uh, and very many rishis have gone deep in it and another occasion from ramayana i say uh, you know bharata takes his younger brother satrugna to his uncle's house uh they are living there one day bharata tells his brother satrugna my dear younger brother last night i had a dream i dreamt that our father king dasaratha applied gingeli oil all over his body he was wearing red clothes he was riding on a donkey donkey towards the south direction this means either he will die or ramana will die or i will die i am very much worried and perturbed about it while he was talking like this to satrugna messengers come from ayodhya telling him about the death of dasaratha so he goes to do the last rites of king dasaratha so if you see gingeli oil particularly apply to your body that shows uh, your death because gingeli oil is used for those purposes you know gingeli they are tila gingeli is used for such rites only so it has a logic behind it and i can tell you hundreds of occasions when dreams have come true even in modern days you know uh, you know cinema lyric writer one man is called kannadasan he used to say whenever i see fickle matter in dream the next day i'll be booked for writing a lyric in a film like that he said so it it has been a confirmed thing it's not mm-hmm. false mm-hmm. that's fascinating yeah i should check out your video and we'll uh, learn more <laughs> uh switching gears uh, joseph ji uh, how would we uh, be able to use the bhagavad gita uh, in our practical day to day lives i delivered a lecture on uh, bhagavad gita the topic was bhagavad gita removes stress that lecture was uh, uh, directed towards the it industry people information technology people were there i said the worst punishment in god's creation is stress when you get a mental stress strain you know that affects your health you might possess money to crores but if you suffer from stress and strain you are not a rich man you are a poor man so bhagavad gita helps remove stress how krishna says first of all assess yourself what are you fit for what are you cut out for do only that so dharma so dharma is that dharma which is stipulated for everybody a kshatriya is born to rule the nation a brahmana is born to study the vedas a vaishya is born to do business like that god has uh, already tabulated that each one must do only this today how to find it out how to identify yourself you go into yourself you find out your temperament your talents you can assess easily what you are meant for if you have a acting talent well go and join the film field if you have teaching talent you become a teacher you know the famous uh, cine actor rajesh khanna he was a good in academic education while he was a school student his teacher one day called him rajesh you please listen to me never go for academic jobs because god has given you talent to act so you please please go to film field don't waste your time in graduation this b and bsc is not going to help you in any way so as per the advice of his teacher only rajesh kana joined the film field and you know he became a multi millionaire after his death he had hundreds of crores of properties left in his name he was a grand success in film field because he is cut out for that only god created him with that talent so if that man wants to become a sanyasi in a buddhist ashrama how would it be just think there sharmila tagore will not come there to buddhist ashrama to sing songs with him so he will be a square peg in a round hole so if you are cut out for a particular job or a particular section of life with some lot of talents find that out and fit yourself into that that is for dharma 
So Bhagavad Gita teaches you, if only a man understands that properly, he'll be rid of many problems. But people don't do. You know, everyone has for his target uh, some posting, some posting in IT industry. I must go to the USA. I must become a, uh, some big man in IT industry. That is their only target. Whether he is uh, fit for that or not is immaterial. That is how life goes, you know. So Bhagavad Gita teaches, do what you are meant for. Find that out. What is the best way to find out our Swadharma? Because uh, now uh, most kids, their parents want them to become engineers or doctors, right? So they're not even given a chance to introspect and find out. So what would be your advice uh, for kids to find their Swadharma? What would be the best way? Of course, that is an unfortunate uh, position because... You know, parents themselves have gone wrong now. You know, parents, the elder, our elder generation has gone astray from the root of our traditional ancestors. In those days, a Brahmin would always compel his son to study Vedas only. He won't ask his son to become a doctor or an engineer. But some 50 years back, the situation changed. Every parent started dreaming that his son must become a man of a white-collar job, a doctor, an engineer, or a man who makes money like anything. The pathetic situation is the temple archakas, you know, archakas who do service to the Lord in the temple, they are not getting married at all because nobody is ready to give his daughter in marriage to a temple archaka. No girl wants to marry a temple archaka. You know, a girl who is born for a temple archaka, who was brought up by that man by the money he gets by doing this archaka, that girl says being an archaka is a libel. It's a very bad thing. It's the most unfortunate thing. I would never marry a tufted man like my father. I want my husband to be a lawyer, an engineer, a doctor, or a man uh, doing this uh, information technology business. In yes. So ultimately, what is the result? 50% of temple archagas are unmarried. They, no girl wants to marry a man like this. So what happens is these temple archagas, they remove their tufts. They have an English crop. They wear pants. They stop this uh, temple service. They come to worldly life. Now this sin, to whom will go? That girl who refuses to marry a temple archaga. I know personally the case of a temple archaga who is archaga in uh, uh, this uh, triple K in Parthasarathi temple. He is wearing 10 rings in all uh, fingers. So rich, so much of uh, offering he gets every day. He has money, he has two cars, he has a bungalow and all. But him, a Brahmin girl would not marry because he has a tuft. Because he goes for a temple service. No, it's out of fashion. They, she wants only a, a bridegroom would go by plane to US, to Singapore, to Malaysia. You know. But they do not understand the real value of life. What happens to that girl who marries a man who is in IT industry? I know the case, uh, you know, a girl, after having married an IT industry man, has divorced him. She says, the moon looks beautiful from a distance. When you go near to the moon, you see it is the ugliest planet. You see so many ups and downs. Like these, all these IT industry fellows are the uh, worst fellows in humanity, she says, and she has divorced him. So from a distance, it is a, a green attraction. IT industry, oh, it's a green. No, no. So every student must, first of all, learn to obey the parent. And the father says, okay, marry this girl, marry this man. Say yes, because he's more experienced than you. But unfortunately, the parent himself has gone, has become a victim to his worldly ambitions. So he gives the wrong directions to the children. So <clears throat> at least the younger generation must realize this. Pray to God that you must be properly guided. And God will offer you good guidance. There is no doubt about it. Thank you so much, Joseph G. That was a very, mm. very uh, fascinating and interesting conversation. Uh, I, I wish we could continue talking. Definitely, we will have more such conversations in future. But really, really mm. appreciate all the knowledge and insights you gave us in today's talk. 
uh thank you so much and wish you all the very best uh with all the great work you're doing with rishi dharma foundation thank you so much most welcome most welcome